through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Drop it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 263. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today we're going to do our discussion of Seth Rogen. Indeed. In honor of the release of This Is The End. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is, you know, this latest comedy. Yes. Uh, this time as a director as well. So, you know, that's something interesting to Gotta talk enjoy about. enjoy that. We'll get there soon. We will. We're going to talk uh, sort of a different sect of his movies, yeah. though. Because we've talked, like, Franco a lot. So we've hit a lot we've of them. Leslie the, Mann. Yeah, we've, <laughs> we've, talked a, yeah we, I mean. <laughs> we've talked a lot of those sort of bodies there. So we're not going to talk freaks and geeks for, like, the 86th yeah. time, yeah, etc. Exactly. So yeah. we're going to try and do a little bit diversity yeah. here. But we'll probably hear a few that are yeah. we've done before. Yeah. Uh, on that note, we're going to sort of start off by talking about one of the more unconventional ones mm-hmm. that most people think don't think of when yeah. they think Seth Rogen, and that is Donnie Darko. Yes. This is the 2001 film from Richard Kelly yes. about a boy who... I don't know even how you want to begin. A troubled teenager is plagued by visions of a large bunny rabbit that manipulate him to commit a series of crimes after narrowing, escaping a bizarre yes. accident. Nearly dies and weird stuff happens. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of discussion of things like time travel. Yes. There's all sorts of... Morality issues. Yes. And, yes. Yeah. And, Fate, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. This is a very interesting sort of crossroads picture. I mean... A, this is sort of during the age when Jake Gyllenhaal was breaking out. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the unique films where he actually acted with his sister, yes. Maggie Gyllenhaal, so that's something. And they played brother and sister. I know. Uh, you this is one of those things where I didn't know who either one of them was afterwards, and yes. I found out that they played siblings in a movie and were siblings. I was like, oh, yeah. wow, I wonder how that happened. Yeah. Uh, additionally, you have people like Jenna Malone playing yeah. the love interest. Mm-hmm. Before uh, she was anything. Mary McDonald playing the mother. Swayze was in this. This Swayze, was one of the last yep, Swayze as a, films. Um, Inspirational, motivational motivational speaker, speaker yeah, yeah yeah you have people like noah wiley and yeah. um drew barrymore drew barrymore as teachers mm-hmm. at the school and then you have people like seth rogan mm-hmm. who you don't really think about but he plays i guess you would describe him as a bully yeah i mean he really is sort of harassing some of the younger students mm-hmm. you know and it's funny to think about like he's known so much as a likable guy that it's so unusual to see him as sort of an unlikable guy and this is his feature film debut actually Wow, that's funny. I didn't yeah. even realize that. So, I mean, y- even though we are not going to discuss Freaks and Geeks and Freaks and Geeks, he kind of plays more of a jerk-ish character. Even though he's all those characters try to be lovable, they're all yeah. troubled and mean. I mean, he, like, it's, it's, I mean, he is sort this of This is definitely tough. closer to that persona. I would, I would say this goes even further than that, because, I mean, Freaks and Geeks, true. like, it's still like... He's he, still a, a main character. Like, guy. he's just, he's like, you know... <laughs> poking at his yeah. friends like he's yeah. not actually trying to be an outright <laughs> jerk and this yes. one like he is just a flat out bully mm-hmm. like he's not uh, a likable guy and this is I mean I mean I'm glad that he's not done too much of this I guess because he is such a good likable guy yes. he's such a likable yes. character but he is remarkably good at being unlikable mm-hmm. as well which yeah. is a very pleasant surprise and I mean this film marked the directorial debut of Richard Kelly as well I've I remember seeing it originally, the, the original theatrical cut in mm-hmm. theaters. Oh, nice! And very much enjoyed it at that mm-hmm. point. Back when I was even sort of prior to it becoming a cult hit, it was just sort of like, a, I guess, a flop at that yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, most likely. It sort of then became a cult hit. It mm-hmm. got re-released through a directorial oh. cu- directorial cut oh. of the film, which was when my love of it fell. Oh off yeah, the it, edge it, of a the, cliff. it was one of those rare occasions where the director's cut is. Not as good as the... Not only not as good, but I would say so bloated that it makes the retrospect of how much you loved the original worse. It hurts it, for sure. (laughs) And I think it also spoke to, you know, how some directors really do need someone to keep them in order. And Richard Kelly, as his career went on, very much demonstrated that yes. with, you know, like Southland Tales uh-huh. and The Box. Like, very creative guy. Yeah. But, like, somebody Maybe needs, needs to somebody, re- yeah, there and to say... Much like mm. M. Night Shyamalan. I think he's another dude mm-hmm. that... Very creative, but somebody needs to be like, you know what? Might not be great Stick to do that. Stick with writing, she's all that. <laughs> Which he did write, by the way. Uh, that's pretty spectacular, Ghost wrote, too. but he did write it. That's pretty spectacular. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's it's a... The original is still a great film. I oh, still yeah. love that. And, you know... Still creepy, still in- really fascinating and interestingly put together. Yeah. And I remember this is one of those ones that, like, when this was out in- to rent, it- I don't think it was a cult classic yet. I think it had just come out to rent kind mm-hmm. of thing. And a friend of mine said, go rent this movie. 
Don't look at the back and read what it's about because they spoil major parts of the movie. Don't worry about how weird it looks. Just trust me, rent it, watch it. Which, I mean, is such a thing that doesn't yeah. happen anymore. We would all Wikipedia or IMDb sure. the movies before we would do that. But I mean, and I'm glad I did. It was great. It's funny to think about, you know, this was a breakout film for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But I would say Seth Rogen was not one of them. No. I mean, he'd had some success with, like, Freaks and Geeks. Mm -hmm. He'd had some success with things like Undeclared. Yes. But it wasn't until, like, a handful of years later that I really feel like he became... A hot property. I would agree. And that was with The 40-Year-Old Virgin. Yes. This is the Judd Apatow uh, feature film directorial mm -hmm. debut um, starring Steve Carell, but also has a nice little side group of characters, you know, Seth Rogen, Paul Rudd, Romani e. Malco play the sort of... Fr I guess you call them friends. Yeah. yeah. They become antagonistic his friends. friends. Yes. <laughs> Very much so continuing that sort of antagonistic yes. vibe that he had before. But, you know, they, they are friends. And they're trying to get this friend laid after... Getting to the age of 40 and yes. not having sex. And this this is like, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say, this is, because, especially because it's Judd Apatow's feature film debut, a lot of this is ad-libbed and, and and not surprising and improvised on set. And, and this is where I think a lot of that begins to work together of his crews kind of all being friends and getting along mm. and kind of improvising and playing off each other and it really being beneficial. I mean, you could sort of see the beginnings of that with Undeclared, where people mm -hmm. like, you know, Seth, or sorry, um... Jay Baruchel? Uh, not Jay Baruchel, um, Jason Segel. Oh, yes. Had, like, cameos and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, like, you could see the ruminations of it there. But very much sort of coming together here. And you're right, you know, um, I mean, technically, Judd Apatow and Steve Carell wrote this together. Yes. But, like, you have a great group of improvisers yeah. such as I yeah. mean, Seth Rogen obviously has a long history of it Steve Carell definitely yep. has a long history of it Paul Rudd definitely has a long history of it I would all very funny funny individuals yeah they're all very great and I mean it's just it's a very dirty movie but at the <laughs> same time it really has a sweetheart and that's sort of one of the things that makes it so engaging yes. I mean I think this is really Judd Apatow I mean to a lesser degree knocked up too but uh this is really Judd Apatow's truest comedy mm, out there. Like yeah. ever since then, he sort of tried to rein it in and become a little bit more heartfelt each time. That's true. Yeah, which isn't that. necessarily a bad thing, but it doesn't end up being quite as funny yes. as the previous work this he had is, done. I, I can agree with that. Even though I do appreciate that he has tried to not just be like, "Well, let's make it more zany and more right. funny every yes. time." He's gone the other direction and right. been like, "Let's make it a little bit more real, yeah, and a little bit more deep than out, outside of just which the, the funny elements." I think is. Um, Notable, mm -hmm. but I don't think he's necessarily been as successful with yes. that. Like, this yes, typifies agree. what people have liked about Judd Apatow. And, I mean, in a magazine interview, Judd Apatow said that for him, is his opinion of the film's success was what uh, why he feels it was successful. Is What happened is during the first preview of the, of the movie, he recorded the preview audience's vocal reaction with a tape recorder. Hmm. Then, when it came to recutting the film for general release, he trimmed the film and synced re the recorded session. So the scenes that did not have the audience reaction were either cut or trimmed. Interesting. Which is why the unrated version is the, when you see, is the original screening. So he kind of like was like, hey, people laughed more at this part and then they missed this or didn't react Get to this. Let's, let's just That's cut smart. it. That's yeah. smart. Yeah, especially for your first film. If you're going to make a first film, you might, you, it's probably good to me, like, let's make sure it hits every, like, you know. And I think this is one of those films that sort of, I mean, obviously he's not the star of the movie, but this yes. is one of the films that sort of, Gave credence to the idea of Seth Rogen as a leading actor. Definitely. Like, I mean, it was very shortly after this, you know, he then goes on to take the lead in a movie mm -hmm. um, from Judd Apatow. Yes. But, like, it very much how funny he was, you know, how well he worked with how people like he El is. Elizabeth Banks. He mm -hmm. and her had great chemistry here. And, you know, they, they go, go on. on to do yep. more with that. <laughs> but, you know, it's 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 just a really funny, funny mm -hmm. movie. That Steve Carell was so worried about how filthy this movie was. He was so worried that it was going to just, like, not be allowed to be released that he actually took the script home and wrote a profanity free version of it so that if they, they didn't if, go there. so that if it happened he could pull it out and be like look we can still do it please I'm, I'm glad they didn't go there because yeah. it ended up you know being pretty close to perfect yeah. so I can't yeah. I can't go there but you know Seth Rogen is a very talented guy in a lot of different ways I mean not only is he an actor but he's done a lot 
of writing yes. himself. And one of the most notable cases of that is Superbad, mm -hmm. which came out the same year as Knocked Up. Oh, wow. I mean, um, both were 2007, I believe. Wow. And there, there, so it was really the year of Judd Apatow, yeah. for sure. I mean, so... You know, Superbad originally was going to be a film starring, I believe, Seth Rogen. I forget who else. Even was, Gold, Evan Goldberg. Was he, Evan going to act in it, too? Oh, I don't know if he was going to act okay. in it. Yeah, I, I, forget, I forget who it was. But originally, you know, like the Jonah Hill role was yes. going to be Seth Rogen. Yeah, because they started the script when they were 13 year old, years old. Right. The Evan Goldberg and Seth Rogen, citing the reason being they just wanted to see if they could make a movie. And they or write a movie. They become a very prolific partnership. I mean, yes. they wrote... Um, they wrote Superbad, mm -hmm. they wrote Pineapple Express, they yep. wrote The Watch, I believe, they wrote This Is The End. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they've definitely worked, they work great together. Yes. And Superbad is, I mean, a tremendously uh, great coming-of-age story about three kids who go out one night mm -hmm. to party, essentially, and try and, you know, Score lose booze. their virginity, yeah. <laughs> uh, get booze, yep. basically prove that they're not the nerds. That they, I think it's like the last day of school or one yeah, of the last days yeah, of school. Yeah, it's like right after yeah. graduation or something yeah. like that. Uh, I mean, Can't hardly wait of the 2000s. Yes. But better. Exactly. Uh, I mean, they're essentially two codependent kids, yeah. <laughs> specifically Michael Sarah and Jonah Hill, and yep. then they have this third sort of tag-along <laughs> character played by Christopher Mintz Plotz, yep. who then went on to become a phenomenon with McLovin. Yes, but, definitely. <laughs> you know, it's it's a really interesting story. I mean, it's very funny, it's very sweet, very much sort of in that same sort of vein as... Mm -hmm. 40 year old virgin but you also have this interesting sort of uh, adult story going on with um bill Hader and seth rogan oh, as the God. cops who are yes. hanging i guess you would say hanging out with yeah. mclovin they're sort yeah. of mentoring perhaps. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. and you know it's, it's this really sort of this was really my introduction to bill Hader. i mean i never oh, i wasn't so a huge good, yeah. snl watcher at this Me point neither, in time yeah. so this was really my oh maybe i need to pay attention to who this he's guy is because so he's yeah. the two of them were so great in this movie their chemistry was so good on it I, I mean it's it's really interesting to sort of see seth rogan as he's becoming this massive star mm -hmm. deciding to take sort of a step back yes. and not try and be the star of the movie and try and like i don't know, update it so he's in college or something exactly he probably would be college age if he had yeah, been it's in true it, yeah so. but it's kind of yeah it's kind of it's interesting to see something like that where he wrote this thing as a kid that originally he was going to play a role and then he gets older and he yeah, like you said, takes a sideline to it, and he's like, "I'll just take a supporting character. Let's get other." People and in there. it was so smart in so many ways because I mean, you know, you have Michael Sarah who had been Arrested Development before this, mm -hmm. but was this is a dramatic departure from that role. Yeah, and I, I mean, don't think he had very many movies. I mean, this no. is pre Scott Pilgrim, pre yeah, Nick no, and Nora. This is really this, is this like... really helped establish him. And Jonah Hill, I mean, he had been like in cameos in like the Forty Year Old Virgin, mm -hmm. where he's almost unrecognizable it was mostly just cameos. Yeah. yeah, and so to put him in here was a stroke of genius. Christopher plots like, as well as his yes. film debut yeah. i mean those three were all just sort of perfectly cast. so well timed and the the story is just is so funny and <laughs> so sweet that it, i mean it's, it's it goes in that stable of like classic coming of age stories i would agree so i i mean without a doubt it's worth discussing mm -hmm. but it's also funny to think about you know after this we're going to discuss kung fu panda yeah a whole separate portion of Seth Rogen's career has been as voice actor, mm -hmm. which a lot of people don't think. I mean, he was in Horton Hears a Who, yeah. which was an excellent film. He did Paul, which I didn't love, but, you know, yeah. he, I mean, again, I, you know, I enjoyed, but also still voice acting yeah. work, relying on the fact that he does have a signature timber of voice. I think that's sort of the problem I've had with him as a voice actor, actually, is that... He, Almost I mean, typecast as Seth Rogen yeah, being it. Yeah, I mean, but it's also sort of so distracting, because I'm just thinking about Seth Rogen the entire time, <laughs> because it's his voice is so distinct. Like, that's... That's the problem, I think, with a lot of these productions like Kung Fu Panda, which is a DreamWorks film, yes. and I very much enjoy it, but I feel like they're much more focused on catch casting celebrities yes. than they are casting the right voice. Yes. And this, I mean, you like uh, Jack Black, Ian McShane, Angelina Jolie, Dustin Hoffman, Jackie Chan, Lucy Liu, David Cross. Like, it's such a star-ridden cast that it's mm -hmm. it is almost distracting because all these people are so iconic whereas you know you think about a lot of those pixar movies and sure they have a few really famous people in them but a lot of those supporting characters you don't know and i mean like toy story sure um what's his name tim allen had been something a while ago and but tom he hanks. wasn't i mean tom hanks is tom hanks yeah. but i mean tim allen wasn't really like popping when toy story came out but he was an a person great, who, had, yeah. you know, was a good voice and actor. And so, so well. Yeah. Like, it's just... And Kung Fu Panda, like, is 
a very sweet film. This is one of the first films that really was even in the discussion of yep. is DreamWorks as good as Pixar. I yeah. still lean towards Pixar. I well, believe this was the same year as Wall-E. Let me check quickly. Probably. Um, I mean, it took four years to make. So, I mean, they were really spending the time to get into, like, we want to make an animated film. We want it to be worthwhile. We want it to count. Like, they yeah, didn't... this is the same year as Wall-E. So, okay. I clearly <laughs> side with Wall-E on well, this yeah. one. But... Yeah, I, I mean, everybody does. They get, they've they gotten better about that, but there's still so much about, like, you know, mass production. Like, they've already done Kung Fu Panda 2. They've yep. got Kung Fu Panda 3 lined up. Yeah, like, they got, like, there's, like, a stage show or something. Yeah, I mean, that. How to Train Your Dragon was the first one that was actually better, in my opinion. But even that, they've got two sequels already in and, like, production for it. like, a TV show or something. Yeah, like, on Netflix. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's a very sweet story about, you know, a panda who's turn into a martial arts mm -hmm. savior for the small town despite you know nobody believe a panda can do it great you know jack black um is pretty solid as the lead but again he's much like seth rogan his voice is so iconic that it's yeah. almost distracting at yeah times. it's it's jack black with a panda skin on yeah. not a panda who sounds similar to jack black. and you know i'll probably say you know even if they recast it I probably would still lean more towards Wally, but I think it oh, would be a better it's film. Kind of hard to they, beat Wally. I think they would have had a better film if they had recast it. I think it could have been a better quality film, hmm. but probably less successful. Hmm. And that's what DreamWorks is really much more driven by. Uh, it was originally going to be a kung fu spoof, like just a, a spoof genre hmm. all the way. But uh, John Stevenson said that he wanted a blend of comedy and action to make the film more epic hmm. uh, because he said he wasn't interested in making fun of martial arts movies because he he thinks that they can re be really great films oh, yeah. and they can be good as any other genre movie when done properly, which is totally true. And I think one of the saving graces of Kung Fu Panda is their actual attention to pretty interesting and good action. Yeah. It's, and, for a kid's movie, it's not. And I will say, uh -huh. you know, I mean, Seth Rogen is one of the Furious Five, I believe he plays yes. the Praying Mantis. Yeah. And so, like, the fact that there's five of them kind of downplays each one celebrity. True. But, you know, all combined, it really feels like one giant celebrity. So, <laughs> it's, it's a very fun film. And I actually... Which is kind of funny to avoid... I mean, I understand the reasoning for picking someone like Jackie Chan. But, yeah. uh, I mean... He's only voice acting, and his English is not the greatest. So his skill is f being physically there. Yeah. So it's know. it's kind of, it's kind of a weird decision, and I mean the sequel was again you know enjoyable, but they didn't really evolve on what. Yeah. It, I I much would have rather have seen a like, typical animated film sequel. Yeah. Do the same thing again, a little bit bigger. Yeah. So. We'll see where they go in the future with that. Yep. But one of the more sort of interesting misses. On Seth Rogen's career, hmm. though, is Zack and Mary, aka Zack Zach and, and Mary make, make a porno. porno. Now, is it a miss financially, or is it definitely a miss? Like I mean, it, it in <laughs> terms of like his usual financial success, it was a miss financially. Yes, okay. I mean, I think it was still Kevin Smith's one or one of Kevin Smith's biggest successes as of two thousand nine. Yes, it was his yeah. most successful film. Uh, prior to Cop Out, so it took <laughs> a long time to get there. But the thing was, you know. Kevin Smith sort of felt like Judd Apatow was usurping him as sort of like the dirty comedy mm. guy. Very much sort of taking Kevin Smith's playbook and sort of making a fortune doing it. And so... Maybe doing it better. Yeah. But bringing um, Seth Rogen in, it mm -hmm. was bringing in Judd Apatow's guy and he thought, this is a surefire thing that's going to make a ton of money. And it didn't in that sort of led to Kevin Smith becoming, you know, obsessed with Pa and so yes, on and so forth. Yes. But I mean... The film is just fundamentally flawed. This is the point where my fanboyism and Kevin Smith begin to diverge. I can see that. Even though I enjoyed the film, I would agree with that. I mean, it's not unwatchable, but it's not nearly as good as other stuff. I mean, the story is about two characters, roommates, Seth Rogen and Elizabeth Banks, yes. teaming from 40 Year Virgin. You got that going for them. Uh, both very funny actors who have to act in a porn to basically make enough money to pay their rent. Yes. Um, which is kind of a really disturbing premise in some ways, if you really think about it. And not surprising. Yeah, for, not surprising. But the problem with the movie is, you know, the first half is very funny, wacky porn mm -hmm. antics where they're filming a porn. Yes. A parody porn of Star Wars in a coffee shop. The second half, though, drops essentially all the comedic elements and becomes this Romantic. really heavy-handed romance uh -huh. movie. And it just, That's like, true. the end, it just essentially doesn't even end. It's just like stops yeah it just stops and it's just sort of like what okay we're done now okay yeah. and it like it doesn't even feel like it resolves itself and, and it's interesting too because I, I think this is one of those 
films where I mean, it, Kevin Smith are specifically had Seth Rogen in mind, so you're totally right with the Apatow el element. He, he was like, oh, if Seth Rogen didn't say yes, I probably wouldn't have done it. Okay, uh, but it's this is one of those things where a film got like, and this is very much in the vein of not surprising in Kevin Smith's career. Mm -hmm. but it got a lot of controversy and problems yes. about the film. Especially like the title. That's why they had changed that. Oh, yeah. They, they, the they original poster the post. was too explicit. Uh, Ended up having to go with the stick, stick figures. figures. Yeah. Um, the city of Philadelphia didn't allow the word porno. Uh, you know, it made it Zack and Miri. Uh, most television commercials dropped to make a porno. The cover of the DVD in most U.S. retailers just says Zack and Miri. Which is funny because this is coming off of a film that had a donkey show in it. Mm -hmm. so, After Clerks 2, yeah. yeah, like yeah. It's, it's really weird that this is the one that really riled people. But I feel like this is one of those things that is very much where the downfall of the Fairley Brothers went. Where it's yes. like, oh, let's make, let's take a funny idea that can have comedic elements and let's focus more on how shocking it can be rather than trying to actually make it quality. Yeah, I feel like And so Kevin's... it dropped in quality because they were just trying to be like, ooh, look at all these sex jokes. And I feel like and Kevin ooh. Smith was feeling pressure to sort of regain his throne regain and clerks. sort of really fin yeah. finally get that hit film. And, and I mean, I, he kind of did because it was successful for yeah, him. <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't nearly as successful as everyone was anticipating yes. it being. And unfortunately led him into Cop Out, which was horrible. Yeah. So. But, like, you know, Sorry, I feel Kevin. like he just pressed to try and make this movie. A lot of his other films felt much more organic. And maybe he would argue that and say this is organic. But the second half of this film just feels not thought out yeah i feel like it's it's like let's make a movie that's similar to how it was when we made clerks because we'll like make it all it'll be like about people making a low budget movie where they work and it'll be funny and we'll have all these elements it so of... many there's so many good people in it i mean you have craig robinson mm -hmm. in a supporting role you have jeff anderson returning you know randall from yeah. clerks is in it and he, both of them are very funny as well mm -hmm. i don't know how you could have so many funny people in the last third of this movie is as funny, is, unfunny as any film besides Red State he's ever it's done. It's true. It is the first uh, Kevin Smith movie that doesn't have either Jason Lee or Ben Affleck. So, I think that's a mistake right there. You know, even Scientology Jason Lee is better than no Jason Lee. His five minutes in Cop Out are good. <laughs> like, probably, arguably the best part. I mean, sans the uh, Sean William Scott stuff. Yes, but, agreed. Yeah. Moving into a very di different area, though. But still on the same general unfortunate downward slope was Seth Rogen's portrayal of the Green Hornet. Yes. This was directed by Michel Gondry. Mm -hmm. I think it's feature film directorial debut. No, no. He had directed something before this. Uh, Eternal Sunshine or something? Uh, I don't know if he directed, didn't he? I think okay. he just wrote a lot. Okay, maybe. I I'll think look that... that uh, 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 maybe. Maybe. I might be wrong. But Seth Rogen did drop a crap load of weight for this movie. This yes. is when he became he got, he thin He really Rogen. became very fit for it. Yes, at 30 pounds specifically that he dropped. So, uh, Scanning through Science of Sleep was definitely before this. Hmm. Oh, okay. uh, Be Kind Rewind was definitely before this. And he directed this. both those? Yes. Oh, well, never um, mind then. I am horribly wrong. Human Nature was before this. Is what this. happens when I don't write the yes. things that are remember He'd done a handful of ones. Here. Human Nature is, interestingly, the like first Charlie Kaufman movie I okay. believe does turn into a film. I think that might even predate being John Malkovich. But, oh man, this, this was just... Were you, I mean, were you a fan at all of the Green Hornet prior to this? I mean, you know, to some extent, as much as people, as I, you can be the fan of a, something that's based on a radio play that you never listen to. I mean, okay. I, I was a fan of the original television show in the element that it had Bruce Lee, and I knew plenty about Bruce Lee being Kato in the original, yeah. so. Okay, let me correct myself quickly, and Human Nature was after being John Malkovich, okay. so it was, one, it was like the forgotten trailer. Okay, I see. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd never read, I, I never really followed the the radio plays. Mm -hmm. I never read the comics, which Kevin Smith has since gone on to do uh, a bunch of comics for stuff. Um, Not surprising. You know, I I thought, you know, the action in terms of it was pretty good. John Chu, uh, mm -hmm. or sorry, Jay Chu, who played yes. Kato, was pretty badass in the movie. The cars Asian were pretty badass. Asian star. Yeah. I mean, uh, Christoph Waltz was pretty fun as the villain. <laughs> yes. A little over the top. Originally, villain, the... Uh, Nicholas Cage was gonna play that character, and he's gonna play it with a Jamaican accent. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, much to Michelle Gondry's displeasure. It, I, I feel like, unfor even though Christoph Waltz wasn't bad in this, I feel this was totally the remember the guy from Inglorious Bastards. Quick, throw him in another movie. 
Yeah, I mean, he was funnier in this one, though. They he really sort of played up the the notion of him as sort of it's like this. Uh, and I mean, sadly, he's probably one of the best parts of the movie. Yes, it's his totally. character. I, I would say the biggest problem with the movie is a Cameron Diaz really brings Ugh. nothing to it except like a faux mm-hmm. romantic. Um, you know, foil, foil, <laughs> sort of love triangle interest. Yes, uh, I it's mean, completely unnecessary. And the whole plot tries to be a little too clever. And not only that, but it's like, okay, in the original series, Green Hornet hero, Kato sidekick. Okay, got it. This... TV show, awesome, well-known actor, Green Hornet hero, yeah. awesome, great. Kato, Bruce Lee clearly amped and much better than the other character the, they took that model and tried to continue it rather than trying to go with the original model and simply having another talented Kato. So yeah. they tried to make it, it be the Kato show yeah, with right. Seth Rogen it, it really, it really feels it. awkward to call it the Green Hornet when it really, Kato should just go off on his own because the totally. Green Hornet doesn't bring a heck of a lot to their He equation. really doesn't and I mean in the original in the original serial Green the, orig- the Green Hornet did Kato was a sidekick. Granted, a very adept sidekick, but he was still a sidekick. Yeah. He still had a Batman-esque hero who had, you know, gadgets and and th- and wealth but and could know, fight, and then he had his sweet martial arts I mean, arts sidekick. Seth Rogen did look good in the film, and he, I mean, he'd done action prior to this with, like, Pineapple mm-hmm. Express, but he, he is not a terrible no, action no. person, but he's just, in comparison, it, it yeah. really shows how glaring, like, I mean, not... Yeah. Comparable. It, yeah. it would literally be as if it, it was Bruce Lee in it, and it was still called the Green Hornet. If yeah. it was Seth Rogen and Bruce Lee, you'd be like, who the fuck cares about this Seth Rogen dude? Why don't we call this the Kato, the movie? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, it's it's very, it's, it's it was a nice effort, but not particularly yeah. successful. Not at all. A much more successful Version or film though was his work on Fifty Fifty. Mm-hmm. This is um, directed by Jonathan Levine, who yes. did The Wackness. Mm-hmm. He did All the Girl or the Boys, La Mandy Lane. Okay, which has sort of been in trying to find distribution for years now. Just okay. played at SIF actually. Oh, nice, um, but has a great buzz. And he also did um, Warm Bodies. Oh, which was nice. An film. Yeah, just came out on the, our DVD rundown last week. Yes, this is written by Will Reiser. Yes, it's a story about a guy who gets cancer based upon his based own on, life. Yeah, Will Reiser. Um, and it stars Joseph Gordon-Levitt in the title role with Seth Rogen playing his sort of supportive, yes. sidekick type friend. Um, you know, it's a really sort of interesting film as it runs the gamut between comedy and drama as yes. I mean, it's the story of cancer. Cancer is <laughs> a really tough thing to make yeah. funny and it really does well in sort of having those heavy moments of drama as well. I mean, it's just not all comedy and not all drama. Yes. It does a good job of balancing the two. I mean, uh, I, I very much would say that Seth Rogen is underrated as a dramatic actor mm. he doesn't do enough of it but yes when he does do it he is actually quite talented and this i would agree this is one of those examples i mean there's some great supporting roles anna kendrick is great in it bryce yeah. howard is really uh, pretty unlikable in it uh, i mean she's basically dumping a guy with cancer so yeah you know, that's, that's not too uh not too positive it's set in seattle though really filmed in vancouver yeah which you know gets a half thumbs if you well they, they there's like they toss in some seattle stuff they toss in some he works for npr and cuts see, a space see, needle shot you see the stranger clippings yeah. in the background they you know they, they they tried i also think it's funny that bryce Dallas howard is actually the one who came up with the title Really? They were shooting around title ideas, and she thought of the idea of 50-50. I feel like you can guess, for those who haven't seen the movie, is about his chances of living. Yes. So Uh, I think it's also interesting, because this is one of those ones that, you know, it became so much, not necessarily just about the story, but about Joseph Gordon-Levitt's acting Mm. and Seth Rogen's acting. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting to find out that James McAvoy was originally cast as Adam. Really? Yeah. He actually... Had to drop out due to personal conflicts, but Joseph Gordon-Levitt replaced him after being called by Seth Rogen less than a week before shooting was scheduled to start. He accepted the role two days before they started shooting. Wow. So, I mean, literally last-minute actor choice. Uh, that's why it's... Very and talented, I think that, dude. yeah, just showcases not only how talented he is, but it's in, it would be weird to think 
of James McAvoy yeah, in the role. It'd be hard to imagine. Yeah. I will I will also say that one of the unique things about this, this is a story about having cancer from a cancer survivor's perspective. Mm-hmm. And it really deals with a lot of those, you know, awkward interactions that those people have yes. with people who learn that they have cancer. And it really it really speaks to what that experience is like and how challenging that in and of itself can Definitely. be. Definitely. It's just a very good film. And weirdly meta too. I like the fact that in the sense that it's like will Riser gets cancer in real life. Seth Rogen ta- helps him deal with it mm-hmm. and convinces yeah, him to write a screenplay. Life, yeah. Convinces him to write a screenplay about the same thing, which Seth Rogen plays it's basically probably cathartic. the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Yeah, it's probably for both of them yeah. to get that out. So that brings us to now mm-hmm. the release of This Is the End. Yeah, um, this is the directorial debut of Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg. Mm-hmm. Stars a whole litany of the Judd Apatow stable. All playing themselves. Uh, James Franco, Jonah Hill, Seth Rogen, Jay Baruchel, Dan McBride, McBride, Craig Robinson. Robinson. <laughs> it's inspired by a short film. I believe it's Seth and Jay, Jay uh, against, against the Apocalypse. Apocalypse. Yeah. yeah, came out like 2007. I yeah. want to say yeah, short film. Um, and it sort of is set against the backdrop of like the rapture occurring in during a party at James Franco's mm-hmm. house. It's probably one of the funniest films I've seen in recent years, without a question. Wow. It's like real. on par with Bridesmaids? Because I know you said a lot, a lot about Bridesmaids when um, Bridesmaids came out. I would say. I mean, I can't remember every film since then, but it's, <laughs> it might be one of the funniest since Bridesmaids, wow. I would say that. It's it's really well done. I think it's, like, they're so good at playing off of each other. Like, they're really great at making fun of each mm-hmm. other. The They do a great job of sort of establishing this world of the apocalypse, and they have so many funny cameos. Maybe a few too many cameos, but, you know, Michael Sarah's yeah. like, the new Neil Patrick Harris uh-huh. from yes. Harold and Kumar. I, think I read that in your review that yeah. you just posted. Uh, Emma Watson is awesome. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like a hardened version of herself mm-hmm. surviving this. And there's a hysterical scene. You've seen a little bit of it in yes. the trailer. It's so much more than it is in the I'm trailer. I'm so glad because yeah. I felt when they released that cameo no, no, in it that they were like blowing the No, no, no. Good. It's, it's it, it really it misses so much of what makes that scene <laughs> awesome. funny. It sh- it really doesn't plays... this actually come out on when a Wednesday? Yes. Okay, yeah, yes, because they didn't want to go against the other big one yeah. coming out Man Friday. Steel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, smart move there. But um, a few days of running start. Seriously, to catch up. seriously. But you know, it's it's got uh, other people. It's got small cameos by like McLovin, mm-hmm. um, Chris from Men's Plus, yeah. Jason Segel has a small cameo. Aziz Ansari, Aziz Ansari, yeah. David Crumholtz. Mm-hmm. It's so oh, Crumholtz. It's it's really good at sort of playing. Uh, the the notions of friendship and sort of morality and what it means to be a friend and sort of mm-hmm. like that. It's got this nice little uh, story underneath the comedy. It's just super funny. Like if you like juvenile humor, you're gonna yes. love this movie. Yes. If you don't, probably okay <laughs> to skip it. But I would very much recommend checking out. This is the end. I think I've it's, heard some. I've heard a lot of really good things about it. And yes. it's, it's, it's worth you know, the time. It's I worth think the money. The concept alone, even without the apocalypse side, is so interesting to take actors playing caricatures of them their actual selves yeah. in present day and just just how fun you how much fun you could have with that like for example Michael Sarah trying to be like very very filthy he can yeah. just be this persona who cares if it's actually anything totally. connected to him just for fun and people are like Michael Sarah you're like that now yeah that's no, why the studios had a lot of problem with them trying to make it in the first place it, it, it was so good I mean it was made for only like 30 million dollars too which is amazing because it looks way more than that there's they quite did, a bit of special effects in the trailer yeah there's a ton of special effects in the movie and I mean they they really did a great job for first-time awesome. directors with a pretty small budget so I'm very definitely check that out but uh, let us know your thoughts on Seth Rogen and what you love of him mm-hmm. um, and join us next time for a DVD rundown for the week of June 18th yes as always we're at MacGuffin that's MacGuff dot in dot in yeah twitter.com slash MacGuffin cast mm-hmm. facebook.com slash MacGuffin podcast phone number 323-761-9842 we're on iTunes we're on blip.tv Miro Roku check in and get glue get some badges and stickers give some stars on itunes and thumbs on youtube comments is there as well we'll hit you back we'll give your comments thumbs oh you give us thumbs we'll give you thumbs and uh we'll see you next time Stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. It's tight. Don't even try to buy the sound. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me